Hello folks, it is time for not more Hobby Nightmares, but for more discussion on Warhammer 40,000 lore that we've been talking about over the past couple of weeks. So, first of all, if you like what I do, uh, the Patreon is down below, and uh, become a member of the channel, all that fun stuff. If you can't do any of those things, then becoming a subscriber of the channel is absolutely free, and really does help me out on the algorithm. So if you like what I do, or if I've ever helped you with anything else indeed, then please subscribe. And help you up to get towards 10,000 subscribers because if we can get if we can get there before the end of the year, I am going to be absolutely ecstatic, and I will be very, 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 very pleased indeed. But anyway, moving on from that, we did a video last week about a Warhammer 40,000 law and how it should be done in the hobby, and whether Games Workshop are using it to go over and make more 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 money out of models, and whether that is warping the law somewhat and changing it for the worse. Um, we came to the conclusion that yes, it was, but basically, the video that I released on how Games Workshop breaks their law to go into profits, it seems like a lot of you found the whining in that video mildly entertaining, which is great, but after reading your responses, I felt like I missed out on a massive point. Probably the most important point, after like, shit sitting off and like, thinking about it for a few days. And those are, where do the game and the law diverge? As in, we have the Warhammer 40,000 game and we have the law. Where do those things separate and go their opposite own directions? And is this an element of 40, or Warhammer 40,000 that it will always hold it back from achieving mainstream success like a Star Wars, Lord of the Rings, or any other property, right? I think it will. I, I think this is something that is very limiting, and I'm going to explain to you why in a second, but... We have seen how Games Workshop treats properties that are already well ingrained in the zeitgeist of nerdiness, like Lord of the Rings. Um, Lord of the Rings is likely one of the most balanced games they've ever released. I really enjoy Lord of the Rings. Lord of the Rings. Why? Because Lord of the Rings is not a setting they control. It was not built to sell models, whereas their own Warhammer settings were built around a game that already existed and was rather popular. One setting in Lord of the Rings was built to stand on its own, with no game in mind. The others, the Warhammer games, are built to sell you toy soldiers. I believe Games Workshop has allowed this to pervert the purpose of their writing, and in this video, I hope to explain why. So as I like to do in most of my videos, I like to split them off into two or three points, so you guys know exactly what I'm talking about. This video will split off into two points. One, examining what Games Workshop are good at in terms of writing law, and the other one in terms of what Games Workshop are bad at in terms of writing law, and a load of whining in between. If that's not your thing, then feel free to click off this video and go and support another YouTuber. No problem whatsoever. But anyway, the good writing that Games Workshop is capable of, because Games Workshop are capable of some tremendous, beautiful writing from one writer to another. Let me just say, some of the stuff they come up with is absolutely elegant and gorgeous and some of the best setting, dressing, writing that I've, I've ever come across. And I've come across a lot at my day job. Games Workshop is capable of writing some of the most elegant and interlocking fantasy I have ever read. As in, one thing leads into another, which naturally leads into another. That, is, that sets off a thing of, of, of dopamine in my brain that is just indescribable. When I read a fantasy setting that, that interlinks so many different things in a beautiful way, and it's, it makes sense. It's gorgeous. Anyway, I would like to talk to you about one such gorgeous thing that I have found in Games Workshop's writing over the years. And those are the Ogre Kingdoms. As I believe they are the best race Games Workshop have ever created from a law standpoint. Because every facet of their culture and society is built to reinforce what and who they are. Both on the tabletop and otherwise. In other words, they are masterfully written. And I think they're masterfully written in four ways. Let's see if you can identify them along with me when I'm reading them out. Number one. Ogres are mercenaries who like shiny things. As such, they occupy cities in the high mountains, controlling the passes that run from east to west. Not only preying on trade caravans, but actually facilitating trade. Ogres are not idiots. They are the tollmen of the mountains, who can and are bought off for a price. They could even end up protecting you if you feed and pay and pay them, right? They sit as like a as like a parasite in the mountains, feeding off of trade coming through their lands, right? 
That'll come up in a minute. Two, their size means they need to almost constantly eat. This is lent into by the writers as the ogres place a large importance on their bellies, on their stomachs. They believe the soul resides within the stomach and even armour their bellies rather than any other part of their body. Being disemboweled kills the soul of the ogre. At least that's what they believe and that is what they fear the most. Number three, their magic system is known as gut magic and relies on a devouring force of magical energy known as the Great Moor. It is magic that comes from the pit of the stomach, from the heart, with a massive oomph, and as such requires no real spells or incantations to cast, simply an outstretched hand and a real hunger to see someone be devoured by your god. Number four, that god in question is of course the Great Moor. You see, a literal meteor slammed into the mountains of the Ogre Kingdom's first kingdoms, and out of the hole grew a massive maw of jagged teeth requiring constant feeding to be sated. Yes, the Ogres are li literally worship a god of, of Lovecraftian size, an alien living as a parasite within the earth of the Warhammer world. Does that remind you of anybody? Indeed, all of this stuff has a narrative harmony weaved all the way throughout it. Those are the four main facets of Ogre lore in the setting that everything else is built off of. And as you can see, look at how lovely, how beautifully that fits together. That all intertwines into one of the most elegant and beautifully crafted fantasy races I've ever come across in, in, in my time reading. And I've read a lot, <laughs> right? I don't know if you know me, I've read a hell of a lot. And... and your lore doesn't always need to be vast for it to be very beautifully written and expansive, and the Ogre Kingdoms are a great example of that. But can you see how this all links together in terms of the Ogres? The, writing, the writers have taken four or five facets of what make their Ogres, well, Ogres, and have built a society around those things. Their models, in turn, are large, bulky, and sweating bastard bulls ready to smash and munch. But they fix their hair in certain ways. They have jewellery, tattoos, and other denoting signals of wealth and prestige. Unlike orcs, it separates them from the orcs, and you can see how their society works, right? Even their rules rely heavily on the smashing of the enemy apart very quickly and taking them to bits to eat them. To keep the morale of your ogres up by grinding the enemy apart into paste. That's literally how they play on the tabletop. If the fight is not over quickly, the low morale of your ogres will cause them to wilt and fade from the game. I know because this has happened to me and my beautiful meaty boys on more than one occasion in, in the old world rules, right? But why does that happen in the, in, the, in the rules? Well, your ogres do not like hard work. The longer the battle goes on, the more they will simply lose interest and wander off to find something to eat or steal for their overtyrant. There is a beautiful symmetry between the ogres in the lore and on the tabletop that made me fall in love with them in the first place. You know, I wasn't completely sold on ogres. I loved their lore, but when I read their old world rules, I just fell in love with the guys. They're just silly. Um, but they act like they do in the lore. And, and as soon as I saw that, I was like, these are my guys. These are the ones. I, even if I lose every battle, I don't care because I want to play as these guys. They're my dudes, right? The same can actually be said of the Orcs in Warhammer 40,000. Their rules and cultures are perfectly wacky, intense, and full of chopping to the point that finding where the law and, and rules separate is almost impossible with the Orcs in Warhammer 40,000. They're a beautiful army to play. There's a reason why everybody likes playing them, and it's not cause, uh, cause, because Orcs are bad. It's because they act like Orcs. Warhammer does silly very well. So... Is every Warhammer faction written this way? No. And that's where we come to the bad. Factions that diverge from their law in the rules. In terms of the bad, I want to use another faction I have a lot of history with. The beautiful fellows in this vid very video footage, the Grey Knights. In the law, the Grey Knights are imperious killers who are presented as cutting through any threat as if it were butter. A single Grey Knight is fighting a fair fight against five fully armed Space Marines, 
will slay all five Space Marines with relative ease. And if you swap those Space Marines for Space Marine Librarians, or another form of Astarte Psyker, the fight would be over even sooner, as the Grey Knight just strips their powers away. The Grey Knights melt demons away in the lore with contemptuous ease. Blood letters and other forms of demons, if they are of a lesser breed, do not even get to cross blades with the normal Grey Knight. They simply melt before coming near them for the most part. Even greater demons cannot stand for long against a Grey Knight who is of a purifier rank, or God forbid, a Paladin, or even Drago himself. Notice, I have not brought up the ridiculous Matt Ward law. That's because the, his law isn't the issue. Write your law how you like. Write your factions as powerful as you like. But your game needs to keep the same narrative harmony for them to be interesting. Grey Knights in the rules of Warmer 40,000 are barely above the average Space Marine in power level. They are, essentially, Space Marines with a few extra toys at their disposal at a much higher points cost. Not good bang for your buck points-wise. In fact, Space Marines are at a huge disadvantage to Space Marines normally. Uh, sorry, Grey Knights are at a huge disadvantage to Space Marines normally, rather than, uh, yeah, all the Space Marines. Anyway, their characters will regularly get slapped around by greater demons, because whilst your rules are geared to deal with them in certain ways, as in your Grey Knight rules are geared to deal with demons in certain ways, in many others, you'll be dead before you get to use them, such as the power of certain demon models. The whole point is that is the demons cannot stand against them. But the demons will win eventually. That's the whole point of the Grey Knight's law. The demons, one, one mano and mano, cannot stand against Grey Knights, no matter how powerful the demon is. That's why Grey Knights regularly banish demon Primarchs whenever they come across them in the law. Right, it's only happened twice, but still, they banish them twice. They've won twice. The reason for that is the demons can come back. They can take more risks. Yeah, Angron can take more risks um, fighting Grey Knights with Abandon because he doesn't really care about object objectives. He wants to kill. And so he lets his guard down and gets killed, right? And gets banished. But he'll be back. This is because the demons can come back at, and fight another day from the warp once again. The Grey Knight only has but one life. This has proven the downfall of the Grey Knights many times in the lore and is a beautiful juxtaposition for how powerful they are. This is not something that can really be shown in the rules for the most part, and I and I agree and I sympathise with that. In short, anyone seeking to play the Grey Knights because they fall in love with the lore are going to be sorely disappointed when the army of elites is turned to mulch by the return of Angron, Mortarian, Magnus, or anything else leaning towards chaos that looks at them with malice. Are they a bad army? Hell no. They can be competitive, but when compared to their lore, they are, quite frankly, a fucking joke. To me, though, this is a symptom of how over-the-top 40k actually is in the lore. In other ways, however, I doubt any player would mind if Games Workshop changed certain aspects of the lore to bring factions more in line with the balance of the game on the tabletop. The elegance of the Ogres and Orcs is lost when balance is thrown out the window to chase sales or, in some cases, sheer laziness of rules writers to find unique and novel ways to match a faction to the lore they are based on. For those of you complaining that Games Workshop once did this and, uh, and uh, to the... Sorry, sorry, I'll read that again so I'm not being a retard. For those of you complaining that Games Workshop once did this and the Grey Knights were broken in early editions as they resembled the lore too closely, I disagree. And I'm going to disagree with my last point as well. Balance doesn't really matter to me in terms of the law. It doesn't. Because the law isn't balanced. If you don't find the game balanced, adapt. Find a way to deal with it on the tabletop and wait for it. It's our main rule on this channel. Choose your opponents wisely. If a player is likely to take wanton advantage of the power level of a faction, maybe... Play someone who actually brings a, brings a balanced army. Games Workshop are almost acting as an overprotective nanny to your feelings when it comes to game balance. But some factions should simply be top of the food chain, but cost a lot more in points. Let me use a case in point being the Grey Knights. <clears throat> to me, this is how a Grey Knight army should look, if, if, we're, if we're looking at it in the law. A true Grey Knight army should be around 5 to 20 models of infantry normal models and characters 
And that is it. Right? That is it. They should not use things like Dread Knights. They shouldn't even be in the game. Or tanks, for the most part. Grey Knights just shouldn't use them. They should teleport in, smash what they are what they are here to smash, and leave. This means they are very powerful, but so expensive that larger armies could swamp them. This actually does happen in the, in the lore. Instead, Games Workshop, what, what do they do? They settle in for the bland, the grey, the non-offensive to your feelings of rules because you get angry when your toy soldiers lose an imaginary battle using dice on a tabletop. I'm sorry, that shouldn't factor in. Keep the, over, keep the overpowered codexes. Keep the overpowered stuff that you're bringing in, as long as it reflects the law. My problem is, the overpowered codexes that are brought out don't reflect the law. They reflect new models that Games Workshop want to sell you. They, re they represent codex creep, a constant creeping up of power, because Games Workshop want to sell you more and more and more models as the lifespan of an edition of Warhammer goes on, right? They're looking to recoup as much money as they can before they bring out a new edition of Warhammer. That's what Codex Creep is. What I'm not advocating for is Codex Creep. I'm advocating for the for the, for the the opposite of that. I'm advocating the Games Workshop to look at the lore that they have and recognise that certain factions are simply more powerful than others and, and use the, the rules accordingly. Tyranids should be able to beat Grey Knights, right? But they should be able to beat them in wildly different right ways than what the Grey Knights would do. They should swamp the Grey Knights and mulch them one at a time. You know, you know, it should be a last stand of heroic noble warriors against these huge, cheap tides of Tyranids. That's how the game should be played. Right now, a 2,000 point game of Tyranids and Grey Knights looks eerily similar in terms of the amount of models on the board. That shouldn't be the case. That shouldn't be the case. We should have 5 to 20 models of Grey Knights standing there going, Oh shit, look at this massive horde of aliens, slaughtering most of them, and maybe winning or maybe losing. Who knows? Because the both armies on the tabletop are based on the law that is written about them. And that's how they fight on the tabletop. Right now, I think every single army Games Workshop brings out, in terms of, apart from the ones that I've already mentioned, let's be honest, they fight to around 60% of the strength of what they do in, in, in the actual law. That's to keep everybody balanced and everybody down. And some some uh, factions go way above that or are, 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 and fight on like a 150% power level. People like the Tyranids, people like Asher Militarum. And before you complain at me that, that, that that's not right because your army is so underpowered, quote-unquote, dude, that's not right, right? Your army shouldn't be going... You shouldn't be able to have a similar amount of models to Grey Knights and other armies like that and hold your own. You should need to bring far more models to go after a Thousand Suns army, or a Grey Knight army, or an, a Custodes army, something that's ultra elite. You should have five, six times the numbers they do. You should just throw models at them till they die. And th that's what I mean. I'm not saying you should have underpowered armies, right? I'm saying your army should be more powerful in ways that are represented in the law. And if, and if the law says... Grey Knights are just more powerful mano, mano a mano than a normal, than a normal um, Guardsman. That should be reflected in the law and in, and in the size of armies. You should be able to win battles in different ways based on the law that attracted you to the hobby in the first place. Games Workshop, in this instance, shouldn't give a crap about your feelings. They should have their armies actually resemble the law that got them to be sold to players in the first place. Anything less is lazy at best, and in my opinion, at worst, false advertising. As you roll up your models from the law on the tabletop, only to see them turn to paste by a simple swarm of lowly tyranids, or bioforms, or anything else, in a man-to-man man -man fight. For those of you who think we should rewrite the rules ourselves, I agree. Eventually, we could. But that is not our place right now. Games Workshop are still, for now, the custodians of the hobby. I was reminded of, of my mum who had a, my mum had a really big complaint when she went to see Robbie Williams in concert last year and Robbie Williams came out and basically led a sing along of all of his songs. And she said, "That's brilliant, Robbie. Thank you. But I paid 100 pounds for this ticket. Do you mind if you sing the fucking songs, please, mate? Would that be all right rather than me? I can sing these songs in the fucking shower." 
why don't you play? And it's exactly the same in the Games Workshop. We pay our money. We shouldn't have to write the rules. They write the rules, right? We then take the rules and we play with them and we find ways to adapt and, and, and work within the rules to get better, to be better at playing the game. Eventually, yes, I firmly believe we will have to write these rules ourselves because they're going to leave us hanging. They're going to leave the, leave the hobby, the game side of the hobby altogether. But I will tell you now, right now, it's not our place. They should do better. They have to do better. What do you think? Do you have any armies that simply do not resemble the law they are based on on the tabletop that you've noticed? Because let's be honest, I only play four or five. I've played against loads of other armies, but I don't play them myself. Why do you think that is, if that is the case? Let me know. Anyway, I hope you have a wonderful rest of your day. I will be back for more Hobby Nightmares tomorrow. Have an absolutely splendid day. And I will see you tomorrow. Love you a long time. Have a good one. See you later.